Good, good afternoon to everyone or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, today we have the uh, next IDC PPA um, webinar in the, and for the first time it's in collaboration with the Democracy in Africa blog run by Nick Cheeseman and his team. And today's um, topic is traditional leaders and democratic accountability in Africa. And I'm very pleased to have such a great uh, set of panels, uh, panelists uh, with me today. We have Happy Kayuni from the University of Malawi. Uh, we have Carolyn Logan from Michigan State University and Afrobarometer. And we have George Ofosu from the London School of Economics. All three are uh, excellent scholars who have worked on traditional leaders and related issues on democratic accountability. And we have, uh, we'll have three presentations as well as a Q&A afterwards, where we invite questions from the audience um, to each of the panelists. Uh, we'll have about 10 to 12 minutes per presentation and we'll go in the order of uh, Carolyn, then uh, who will speak about kind of the broader issues and uh, cross uh, national comparison. And then we'll have uh, Happy Kayuni uh, talk to us about the uh, situation in Malawi yeah. and how about the legitimacy of traditional leaders in Malawi. And lastly, um, but definitely not least, George Ofosu will talk to us about the role of traditional leaders in campaigns in Ghana. Um, all three also have written extensively on this, and so we will um, link the papers that are uh, the latest papers uh, by everyone um, on the YouTube channel, where we will also upload the video recording uh, from today. And you'll also find others, um, other talks from, from previous webinars on presidentialism, on the recent elections in Zambia, the future elections in Zimbabwe, as well as uh, several other um, talks that, that you might be interested in. So feel free to check that out as well. Um, and yeah, without further ado, Carolyn, it's over to you. Great, thanks. Let me just share my screen and we'll get started. Okay. Um, all right. Got me? Just, just... Yeah, Zoom is suddenly giving me trouble. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I think. Okay. Yeah, right. it's just a don't send message. Otherwise, we're good to go. I think. Yeah, okay. But, but you see my presentation now. It's behind the Zoom. It's behind the Zoom. Um... <sighs> Okay, that is gone for me. So let's see if I can figure out. Um, is that still showing the Zoom message? Yeah. Okay, there, let's go that. Try that, cancel. You're still seeing a Zoom message, is that right? Yes. I, uh, I'll be honest, I doesn't show on my screen, so I don't know. Maybe if you, if you stop sharing. Okay, second. stop and re restart. Okay. Hmm. This is a new one. Sorry. No problem. All right. Uh, boy. So, sure. Okay, we seem to have lost Carolyn. Oh no. I think she's still there. She's you're still there. Okay. Am I still here? Uh, this is something's really going haywire. Um, can you hear me? Yep. All right. I'm gonna try one more time to share the screen. We tested this before and it worked just fine. So I'm not sure what's happening now. Okay. This looks better. All right. Okay, are we good? Good to go. All right, great. Wow. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so um, 
I am at Michigan State University. Thank you first, uh, Matias and Sashua for uh, organizing this and bringing us together. I love to talk about this topic and uh, happy to be here today. And um, I'm just gonna, what I'm gonna be sharing today is mostly some data from round eight Afrobarometer surveys, which took place from 2019 to 2021. Um, I'm going to work on the assumption that most people here know about Afrobarometer. If I need to come back and say more about that, I will. I usually start with a spiel about it, but, but time's short, and I think people hopefully know a bit about it. We do public attitude surveys. Uh, this is all the countries we've worked in in round eight, where most of this data comes from. We were in 34 countries. 31 of those countries asked about traditional leaders. Cape Verde, Mauritius, and Tunisia do not ask those questions. So most of what you'll see is from those 31 countries. And I'm going to launch right in um, to to uh, just some of the findings that we've got. Um, I'll just say up front, this is you know, we're, we're, we have tons of data to analyze and we haven't done a ton with this data on round eight yet. So what I've got mostly is descriptive statistics, but can refer back to um, earlier work that we've done that is pretty much consistent with what we've got here in terms of attitudes to democracy and, and traditional leaders. Um, but we also have some new stuff in this round that will be kind of fun to report. So I'll just launch right in with that. Um, first off, I'll just say that what we've consistently found since we've been asking questions about this and looking at the data is that traditional leaders generally score more highly in terms of qualities of leadership. You can see on the left, uh, this compares traditional leaders and orange presidents, local government counselors and MPs. Um, traditional leaders score higher in terms of positive qualities on all of these. They're more trusted on the left, you can see. Um, they're less likely to be seen as being corrupt. Uh, their performance is rated more highly and they're much more likely to be said to listen to their constituents. Although note that only 43% even with traditional leaders say that they actually listen to people. Um, so not a, a, um, an unqualified endorsement, but nonetheless, they're seen as, as um, having more positive qualities than elected leaders in general. That does vary hugely across countries. As you can see here, some countries, Ethiopia, Mali, Niger, with more than 80% saying they trust traditional leaders somewhat or a lot, 60% on average. But you can see over on the, the right-hand side about uh, seven countries or so that where, where less than a majority say they trust traditional leaders, led by South Africans, actually. Um, and you know, lots of data that could be dived into more deeply here, but um, uh, you get a sense of the range. One of the things we often look at, you know, given that traditional leaders, you know, they're, they, they are, tend to be a patriarchal institution and a gerontocratic institution. Um, so we look at how attitudes towards them vary across uh, different demographic groups. This again looks at the trust. Remember, it averaged about 60% for traditional leaders. Um, you can see actually men and women, almost no difference on this issue, no statistically significant difference. Um, at the bottom, that's at the top. At the bottom, you can see rural people might, much more likely to trust them, although even in urban areas, uh, nearly 50% do. Although I think I will be looking more at the overtime data. I think in the past, we've consistently seen majorities across all these issues. Now we can see a, a few slipping. You can see that poverty level has some influence. The big influence is education, no formal education, much more likely to trust. But even among those with post-secondary uh, education, 49% um, saying they trust. So uh, quite some variations, but pretty consistently high numbers. Um, we also ask questions about the influence of traditional leaders in different activities or sectors. And on the left, we've got the, the blue are the groups saying they, tr they have either a lot or some influence. And on the right hand in the orange, either a smaller amount or no influence in those areas. You can see solving local disputes, two thirds say they play uh, an important role in that area, including 40 six percent who say they they play a lot of role it's followed by governing the local community allocating land still 52 percent saying they play an important role the area where they play the least role uh is vote choice um according to what what people tell us uh we'll i'm sure hear more about that from some of the other presenters um only 19 percent say they have a lot of influence in this area it's an area that's that's receiving quite a lot of attention and study um 
I took, since I have co-presenters from Ghana and Malawi, I wanted to look at how those countries specifically compared on these indicators of influence. So the blues are the average, green is Ghana and yellow is Malawi. You can see that Ghana and Malawi are above average in terms of the, the numbers saying they have important influence in solving disputes and in governing the local community. Uh, Ghana on land way above, uh, traditional leaders still playing a much stronger role there than kind of seen on average, whereas Malawi is much more average. In both cases, below average numbers saying that they have an important influence on vote choice. And so I thought I'd put those out there to, to contribute to the discussion following those countries. Um, this is a new question that we ask in round eight about uh, who people think traditional leaders tend to serve, whose interests uh, traditional leaders serve. The green bars are those who say the traditional leaders mostly look out for what is best for people in their own communities. Uh, the, the orange bars in the middle are those who say traditional leaders look out mostly for their own, um, sorry, the red bars are those who say uh, traditional leaders look out for their own personal interests. Um, and the orange bars are those who say they look out for the interests of politicians and government officials. You can see nearly two thirds on average who say that they're looking out for the best interest of their communities. So overall, a pretty positive assessment. Um, you know, only, only uh, just over one in 10 who say they're mostly serving their own interests. Um, but you can see that, that there's quite, again, quite, large country variations uh, across this and, um, uh, you know, Morocco, South Africa, Angola, um, and Tanzania, where, where uh, much lower numbers say that they're serving the community interest, but also you can see that except for Morocco, a large share of the gap is made up by um, people who say that they are, uh, that, that they don't know or they don't really have an opinion on the issue as opposed to people who, who say that they're serving other interests. So uh, I think interesting findings there as well. This is a question that we asked in the first part of round eight. So we had to divide round eight into kind of two parts, one that was pre-COVID and one that was post-COVID. This question, unfortunately, had to be dropped in the second part to make room for COVID questions. But it, it asks about the traditional leaders' um, relationship with local government. So we just have this data for 18 countries, but we ask about whether they work mostly in cooperation with um, uh, local government to um, get things done, that's the blue bars, or whether they're more in competition with elected leaders for resources, power, and influence. Uh, and you can see that the, the proportion saying they're mostly in cooperation far outweighs those who say they're mostly in competition. Um, you know, Malawi being one of the countries that's very high on the mostly in cooperation, Ghana a bit lower on that, that indicator. But we also ask a, a, about traditional leaders' role in vote choice and whether they should. This is a question not about whether they do play a role. That's what we saw earlier. This is the question about whether they should play a role. So we ask people whether traditional leaders have a better grasp of issues and they should give their people advice about how to vote, which is the blue bars on the right, or whether they should stay out of politics and leave people to make their own decisions, which is the purple bars on the left. You can see it's about three to one in favor of, of traditional leaders staying out of politics uh, and letting people make their own decisions. Finally, we ask a question about traditional leaders in democracy, whether people think that traditional leaders strengthen, uh, you know, we, we set it up by saying they, they obviously are unelected. Some people are concerned about what their appropriate role should be. Um, but you can see green bars say they strengthen democracy, blue bars that they weaken democracy, and orange that they don't make any difference. And uh, more than three quarters um, either feel that they're strengthening democracy or not really making a difference. Now, of course, various people can disagree on this, but this is what the public view of the role of traditional leaders is. Um, one other question that we've asked a couple of times and that we still see very high ratings on is whether the role of traditional leaders should increase, stay the same, or decrease. The dark bars on the far left with 51% say that the role should increase somewhat or a lot. Another 29% say it should stay the same. Only 13% on average thinking it should decrease, although Morocco stands out as a big exception on, on that number. Um, just two couple more things here. One is um, looking at the question of whether um, how traditional leaders attitudes about traditional leaders interact with attitudes about democracy. There's been there was the concern that if people are pro traditional leader and the 
the role of traditional leaders, it's going to be bad for democracy because that undermines voting. What you can see in this chart is the, the yellow bars are those who think the influence of traditional leaders should decrease a lot. The purple bars are those who think the influence of traditional leaders should increase a lot. And what you can see is there's very few difference, very small differences. Um, and in fact, the differences favor those who think the role of traditional leaders should increase. They're more likely to prefer democracy. They're more likely, although it's not a statistically significant difference, to say that elections are best to choose leaders. And they're more likely to rate their countries as, as democratic. So um, just to summarize, uh, we see that traditional leaders still tend to be rated more positively than other leaders. They are seen on average, there's wide variation, but on average as being co collaborative and putting the interests of their communities first. Uh, people still wanna see their role increase and their role is more significant and welcome in conflict re resolution and least significant and least welcome in vote choice. And overall, we have no evidence that people really see a contradiction between traditional leaders' role in governance and effective and accountable democracy. And I will wrap it up there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Carolyn, and thanks for being right on time. Um, so with this broad overview that we've now gotten from across the continent, um, we'll go to Malawi next and Happy will present on the legitimacy of traditional leaders and how it is affected by various factors. Happy, over to you. Uh, thank you. Are you able to see my slides? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, just a, a disclaimer uh, that the, um, what I'm presenting um, is actually based on a, um, a survey that we did just before the round eight of Afrobarometer. So it's not Afrobarometer, but uh, um, it's a different national survey that we did in Malawi. And it was just before the round eight of Afrobarometer. Some questions are similar, but not exact. Um, the majority are not. It was uh, our survey was mainly was actually exclusively focusing on the traditional leadership. And the, uh, I should mention that the, uh, the names you see there: Michael Chasuga, Boniface Duani, Gifty Sambo were involved in this survey, and that's why I have included their names. Uh, uh, I should also mention that uh, some of the uh, uh, analysis and the explanation that I've provided in this presentation uh, 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 has not been approved by Chasu Kwadula and Sambo <laughs> uh, because we did a publication based on this presentation. We have done two publications, uh, but uh, for uh, the purposes of this uh, webinar, I added certain things, removed certain things. So. Uh, that's why I wanted to put out that disclaimer. Um, so although um, uh, originally it was meant to be focusing on legitimacy only, but I tried to stretch it a little bit by um, uh, looking at the issue of accountability. Um, and my presentation is uh, long, but don't worry, I am going to skip a number of slides. The reason why I, um, uh, they are long is because um, when they'll be uploaded, etc. I want people to have uh, a clear picture of uh, what uh, um, uh, the presentation was all about. So there are certain things for the sake of this presentation I'll skip. I will not necessarily uh, address them, but uh, uh, those who need this, uh, these slides, they'll get a full presentation of certain areas that I'm going to skip. Yeah, so basically, um, oh my goodness, I am failing to move from one slide to the next. I don't know what I should do, is it? Um, okay, so um, let me uh, just mention a little bit about the uh, uh, Malawian context. So chieftains um, in Malawi has a, a long history, um, but in 20, uh, 1912, that's when he, um, under the British um, uh, administration, that's when we had the uh, first ordinance, native ordinance, uh, which recognized the traditional leadership. That was the first time that officially it was recognized by 
um, uh, the uh, British administration. So the British administration has been in Malawi since the, um, 1891, but uh, it was in 1912 when it was officially recognized. And uh, what Malawi is now using is the Chiefs Act, which was enacted in, um, on 29th December, 1967. And uh, one of the uh, uh, issues highlighted in the Chiefs Act is the, uh, that the role of the traditional leader is preservation of public peace, uh, carrying out the traditional functions of the office in accordance with customary law, and also to carry out and enforce lawful directions of the district commissioner. Uh, but in reality, what has happened, because the 1967 act has been outdated, there was a report that was in, um, produced in 2015 uh, which recommended the um, comprehensive changes to the act. Uh, but so far, uh, it has not yet been, uh, that has not yet been done. So we have not yet amended the 1967 act. And the, uh, but in practice, what we are seeing is that um, uh, traditional leaders in practicing, um, they are mainly geared towards mobilizing communities for development. And we also see that in most cases, they are used by politicians, especially the government of the day, um, uh, usually in campaigning and other related things. That's what we see um, uh, where they are more visible. So they are more visible in um, uh, uh, mobilizing communities for development and so on. Um, and it's in chiefs are housed, I'm using the word chiefs uh, to imply traditional leadership. Uh, so they are housed in the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development under uh, the Directorate of Chief Administration. And they also are uh, traditional leaders, um, ex officio members of the district council meetings. And uh, these are the key committee, uh, this is a key institution as far as the development is concerned at the local level. So they, um, uh, they, they are members of that uh, committee. Um, so this is the structure of traditional leadership in Malawi. We have um, uh, um, on top the paramount chief. So it depends on uh, which ethnic group. So some ethnic groups do have the paramount chiefs, others don't. Others maybe have uh, the most senior is a traditional authority in some cases. Um, but uh, so not all ethnic groups have uh, paramount chiefs. So it's an issue about numbers, about history, et cetera. So some uh, ethnic groups have uh, paramount chiefs, others don't. And then from there, we have senior chief and then uh, below the senior chief, traditional authority, then sub-traditional authority, then group village head, then finally village head. Um, so, uh, specifically, uh, uh, in my presentation, uh, uh, there are three areas that I'll be interested in. Perception about the role of traditional leaders, perceptions on the legitimacy of traditional leaders, and the attitudes towards dual administration in Malawi, based on the said survey that we did in um, uh, 2018. Um, now, perceptions of the role of traditional leaders. Um, so perception of Malawians is that the role of traditional leaders uh, mobilizing their subjects for development activities. So this raises the question of accountability when you, uh, you look at uh, what Mal the perceptions of Malawians um, are concerning the role of traditional leadership. For instance, 91% consider traditional leaders to be relevant in the modern era. So um, our findings in this case are not uh, different from uh, what the uh, um, uh, uh, Afrobarometer findings also say, as presented by uh, Caroline, um, that uh, an overwhelming majority of Malarians feel that traditional leaders are relevant. Uh, um, this is a complete departure of what is also said in sometimes in uh, the media in Malawi, some people uh, tend to say that we don't need the traditional leaders, they are outdated, et cetera. But when you go on the ground, um, it's different. So our survey confirms also uh, what the um, Afrobarometer also uh, did find. And also 82% consider traditional leaders to be qualified. I mean, that's also very important. I'll, I'll come back to that later. Uh, and another 82 consider their traditional leaders to be development conscious. And also 50% of Maoyas consider the most important role of traditional leaders to be mobilizing their subjects for local development projects. So as you can see here, uh, that we, um, contrary from what other people are saying or think uh, that probably uh, the role of the traditional leader is the custodian of culture, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, but 
uh, it's fascinating to see that the majority of Marawians look at the uh, traditional leaders as mobilizing people for development as very important role that which um, uh, they play, uh, followed by culture. And there's a significant difference between uh, mobilizing people for development and the custodian of culture. Um, uh, and also then we are, um, uh, the third one was representing the uh, views of the people, custodian of land and so on. And the, uh, also a majority of Malawians would prefer a change in how traditional leaders are selected um, uh, with 56% uh, preferring elections compared to 42 who support the current inheritance system. Uh, so what we have currently is that the, um, uh, we have an inheritance system. So it is passed on uh, through the bloodline or the royal bloodline um, uh, in order to uh, 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 find the next uh, uh, chief. Uh, but uh, um, a good number, which is 56% are preferring elections. And I'll come back to this later uh, uh, to explain probably the possible reasons why uh, um, a good number of Malawians feel that maybe we should go for elections. I should point out that in our survey, we did not necessarily um, uh, 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 comprehensively look at this to say that uh, what type of elections, um, uh, does it mean that the candidates should be from the royal blood or anybody within the village or community? Uh, I think we didn't engage on that, but uh, uh, so that's uh, important for us to know. But uh, um, also there's a sharp contrast to traditional leaders themselves well, because they the survey we had two parallel surveys, one for the ordinary Marawians, another one among the uh, traditional leaders themselves. So the traditional uh, leaders themselves, it says 83% prefer the current system of inheritance, uh, while only 15 um, uh, we are supporting elections. Now, what about perceived legitimacy? So compared to their elected counterparts, traditional leaders enjoy uh, support nationally compared to MP, president, and the councillors. And the, uh, I think this has uh, already been mentioned by Caroline, which is related to her findings. Um, they are not significantly different. Um, as you can see, traditional leaders top the list for those who are trusted, followed by um, a village head. And um, uh, there's a significant difference between uh, trade, um, a village head, who is a traditional leader, and an NGO uh, uh, leader, uh, who is the third um, at 65 and the elected um, leaders, uh, local councillor, MP, and the president uh, all below um, uh, 50. Uh, uh, so you can see uh, that uh, just as Caroline mentioned, uh, it's related. We also tried to disaggregate um, that hierarchy of traditional leaders to find out um, uh, mo um, uh, who was considered to be most knowledgeable authority about local development. And the, um, when we disaggregated that hierarchy of traditional leadership, uh, it was seen that the village head uh, topped the list. Um, so the village head um, uh, uh, and the ordinary uh, villagers themselves, the councillor, the group village head. So um, group village head is within the traditional leadership hi uh, hierarchy. And um, uh, then the VDC is the Village Development Committee, then a, a member of parliament, then a traditional authority, then NGO. So uh, at 4%, we have traditional authority, who is at least higher in the hierarchy of traditional leadership. Um, uh, and the, uh, but the one who is at the lowest level in the ranking is the uh, village head. I'm talking about the hierarchy of leadership. So the village head is the lowest and is the one who tops the list in the knowledge about local development, which makes sense because the, the, tradition, the village head stays with the people in the community, uh, but uh, traditional authority is a little bit higher in authority looking on overseer of many villages. So it makes sense that the traditional authority is a little bit divorced from um, the village head. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of corruption, I don't need to spend much time here. Uh, because it's related to what uh, Caroline also presented, that uh, uh, traditional leaders are in the li uh, list of those who are perceived to be uh, corrupt. Uh, uh, and in, uh, in terms of statistics, we see them here uh, sharing with member of parliament. Statistically, they are at number two, uh, at uh, the first being government officials. Um, and also in terms of the most influential voice, voices, we, we tried to disaggregate uh, also the hierarchy of traditional leadership. 
and on top we have the village head followed by the group village head going down like that. So the village head is closer to the people, tops the list in the most influential voice. Um, and we also looked at this issue of dual um, uh, duality, as it is in, uh, said, dual uh, administration. Uh, we have uh, only uh, uh, government or uh, elected officials, and on the other hand, we have non-elected traditional leaders. Uh, looking at that duality, we are trying to compare that. And um, uh, four in five Malawians, that is 79%, support the idea of traditional leaders getting paid for their role in complementing government efforts. They, as I should mention that this survey was also part of trying to react to what was being said in the media. Um, uh, in the media, there was that discussion, that uh, um, debate in Malawi to say that traditional leaders are not important, government should not even consider them to be on the payroll. They are useless. Uh, so we did ask the people and, and the, the majority um, uh, said that uh, they should be, um, uh, be paid. Uh, so this compares to nine, uh, 19 who think traditional leaders do not need to be paid. And also seven in 10 Malawians approve uh, of the participation of traditional authorities in district council meetings. As I mentioned that they attend the council meetings, which is a key development uh, um, uh, 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 committee meeting at the district level. So they support that idea that, uh, um, uh, so in terms of decision-making, um, Malawians uh, express confidence in their traditional leaders making so decisions on development projects compared to elected leaders. Um, uh, and they also, uh, uh, we should have uh, authority to select development projects at village level. The majority of the, say, the, uh, all members of uh, the village have the authority to select. So it's about participation that everybody in the village should be able to participate and determine what type of uh, development projects should take place, uh, which um, uh, for uh, uh, development scholars is good, uh, uh, the issue of participation. But uh, it is uh, interesting to note that 17%, uh, um, which it might look uh, uh, not a significant number, but in our view, it is a, a significant that 17% had even the, uh, that idea to say that the village head alone can determine development projects in a village, which in our view also clear, uh, clearly shows that uh, um, uh, people have a lot of trust in the, uh, traditional leaders and they feel that um, uh, uh, they can uh, have the uh, um, uh, uh, they can determine a uh, uh, development uh, path for the village or community. Uh, now, this raises a number of questions um, or, uh, or puzzles. Uh, why a lot of trust for traditional leaders, but also one of the most corrupt? So Afrobarometer and the um, anti-corruption um, uh, uh, SCB studies, which were previously done in Malawi, have also confirmed the same, uh, just like ours, to say that uh, uh, traditional leaders are perceived to be corrupt, but at the same time, they are the most trusted. Um, why? Uh, uh, so that is a, a question, a puzzle that uh, uh, lingers. Um, uh, is it, uh, so there is the issue, is it legitimacy is not equal to accountability? Uh, maybe uh, a need for a better definition of accountability that fits traditional leadership. Uh, one of the issues that we have been uh, discussing about uh, this puzzle is that uh, probably um, political leaders, elected leaders, you know, they have a manifesto when they are campaigning, I will do X, they make promises. Traditional leaders don't promise anything. So maybe for politicians, there's a higher level expectation of what they can do. For traditional leaders, there is nothing really um, ex expected from them because they don't campaign. Uh, is, uh, and so on. So probably uh, because of that, uh, it could be possible that uh, although they are perceived to be uh, corrupt, but uh, uh, maybe um, the issue uh, uh, doesn't affect trust. So corruption, trust, why is it that they are taken different? So it's a puzzle, a question that um, still needs to be looked at. Uh, uh, the other yeah. issue is uh, we were um, interested in that. Okay, okay. A good number we are saying that um, we should move towards elected traditional leaders. Um, and probably, and of course, this is going to enhance accountability. 
for example, in the case of Malawi, uh, about 30 chieftains uh, succession wrangles have happened in the past 10 years. Um, examples include tra tra traditional authority, Mzikwora, Paramount Chief, Chukula Maembe, et cetera. So um, there is probably uh, some kind of uh, um, uh, 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 confusion in the way traditional leaders are, uh, 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 although it's uh, inheritance, but that inheritance is so fluid that it leads to succession wrangles. And then uh, uh, possibly that's why people want to bring some sanity to the way traditional leaders are uh, elected. And probably that's why uh, there's uh, this issue of uh, moving towards elections. Yeah, um, so in conclusion, our results show that most Malayans do not think there's any problem in having traditional leaders work alongside elected political leaders. In fact, traditional leaders are viewed as important institutions in their daily lives. Um, while the democratic theory would suggest elected le leadership should displace hereditary and unelected uh, institutions, Malawians have greater confidence in traditional leadership. And we also need to harness the reality of dual um, administration and they seek to find ways that can make traditional leaders more responsive and accountable. Uh, conversely, elected leaders need to learn from their un uh, unelected traditional counterparts and seek to nurture the same levels of trust and confidence of the ordinary citizens. Uh, this is how we uh, concluded the, our um, uh, survey. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Happy, for this really rich presentation and some really interesting insights um, on, on the traditional leaders and how they relate to other, especially elected officials. Um, okay, let's move to our third presentation. This is from Joshua Fosuna at the LSE on the role of traditional leaders uh, during the campaign period. George, over to you. Oh, Happy, can you please stop sharing the screen? Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, George, you're still muted. There we go. We've got it in full screen. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot for uh, in the invitation and thanks everyone for attending because we are out of time. I will just skip a lot of, um, uh, you know, intro stuff. So this paper is uh, co-authored with Sarah Briley, who is also an assistant professor at the London School of Economics. And it looks at the effect of uh, endorsement by traditional authorities of uh, presidential candidates in national election on vote choice. So uh, this is focused on the on Ghana's 2020 presidential elections. Uh, it was essentially a rematch between two candidates uh, of the two major uh, parties in Ghana, the national, uh, the New Patriotic Party, and the National Democratic Congress (NDC) and the MPP. So on the left here is the presidential candidate who was also the incumbent candidate. Uh, and on the right here is the opposition candidate who had served uh, in a previous administration and was coming back for a rematch re uh, to, to win back power. So these were the two candidates. Um, what we observed during the campaign and in previous campaigns were that the president together with his team uh, we're all over the country launching projects and commissioning new ones and, um, you know, attending functions at which uh, the traditional authorities of the areas were invited to such occasions. And uh, as courtesy demands, most of the events would have traditional leaders making comments, welcoming the president and making speeches. And part of the speech came endorsement. And I'm going to be very precise about what we mean by endorsement. So our observation during uh, the campaigns were that you know, traditional leaders welcome the, the, the president to their traditional area, which is the area that they govern with a couple of sub-chiefs 
and I will refer to uh, Happy's presentation. Uh, so we have very similar structure of traditional authorities in Ghana, traditional uh, paramount chiefs followed by some sub chiefs and elders at the village levels and so on. Um, so uh, we, our focus here was on the very top, the paramount chiefs of a, of a traditional area uh, who often, because he's the head of the area, was the one who was to welcome the president to the area and, and speak on behalf of their people. So this is an example of endorsement as we take it from such functions. Uh, it normally had two parts. One was some sort of uh, rationale behind uh, the follow-up endorsement by the traditional authority. So you have the national, uh, the, the, the paramount chief praising the president for some sort of national achievement followed by some local development projects that was deli delivered by the government and often followed by some request of what the president should do when they win back power and then a follow up with an approval. So here is uh, the paramount chief of a traditional area, troubled traditional area in the, in the, in the Bono region of Ghana, who was praising the president for exemplary leadership and uh, social intervention programs that they have launched during their term in office. They praised the president for constructing a road within that area. And it was followed by a request of, for communication, improving the communication network within the traditional area, building a police station to improve security services and, and, and complete uh, the road that they have commissioned. Then there is this approval uh, saying to the president, for all the things that you have done, we will not let you down. Uh, we will say four more for Nana, which is essentially re-electing. We want to re-elect the president. So that's like an endorsement in our view. So if you look at this, you can see that the endorsement provided by traditional leaders are often some sort of a compound statement, one about rationale and one about the approval itself. And we want to figure out um, whether, if we want to figure out, for example, whether endorsement have an effect, uh, one of the way to look at it is also to look at whether the different components of the endorsement have different effects on, on citizens' vote choice. So I'll come to that shortly. So the research question that motivates us here is whether such an endorsement have an effect. And if it does, we want to know which type of voters are influenced by such approval by traditional authorities. And I think more importantly, because this is sort of the uh, lacuna in the literature at the moment, we want to figure out through what channels, through what mechanisms, uh, traditional leaders influence their subjects' good choice. And I'll, I'll be very uh, clear on why we care about that. So why do we care about that? There are two, I think, prominent debates in the literature. The first is that, which is more problematic, is that traditional leaders can actually undermine the electoral connection between voters and politicians. Why do we say that? Well, as we have seen from the two previous presentations, uh, traditional leaders are very important local elites who control materials and like social resources that subjects often relies on. And as Caroline's presentation pointed out, uh, citizens believe that, you know, the yeah, traditional leaders play an important role in governance and land administration in their communities. These are important resources that citizens rely on. These leaders are unelected, right? So there's limited checks on their power, even though there is current evidence that they are, they are often consultative and all that. And so the fear is that they can exploit that position to coerce vote for their preferred candidate. But there's also an alternative view in the literature, which is that leaders can actually promote democratic responsiveness. And why is that? So Baldwin, for example, argues that in weak states, the provision of local public goods, and I think Happy emphasized this in, her, in his presentation, there is this sort of collaboration between local authorities and politician elected leaders to produce local public goods. And so if you believe that there is a need for that effective well working relationship, then you are, you are going to take the pronouncement of your traditional authorities seriously. Because if there's not effective working relationship, 
that might undermine the provision of local public goods that you care about. But there is also another angle which we emphasize, or which we are sort of studying in this, in this paper, which is about signaling uh, competence and, and quality about the politicians who the, the traditional authorities endorse. Now, why do we say that? Why is endorsement an indication of quality or uh, you know, a cue for quality? Now, chiefs often are trusted. So first of all, voters care about public goods and provision of services within their communities. And uh, chiefs also care about this, uh, both uh, for their private and their economic interest. They care that local developments occur. So there are a couple of studies, for example, Gostan and Audrey, which suggest that traditional leaders are often the key investors within their traditional areas. They, they own businesses, uh, they earn royalties from, from you know, different explo exploitation of resources from their communities. And so for economic purposes, you know, they are wedded within the communities within which they live in. So the production of local public goods like roads, electricity, and so works for the people, but also works for them as well. Also for their for their own social position, you know, they they are continuous rule often rely on promoting the well-being of their own citizens. And so this sort of you know interest of DS align with that of um, with that of citizens. Ironically, you know, chiefs cannot provide these resources themselves. Very capital intensive local public goods rely on the state providing some sort of capital because most chiefs cannot tax their citizen as they used to do. And so that is uh, assumed by the state. So they both rely on the government for this. And therefore, citizens are probably more likely to believe that if somebody, you know, if someone is endorsed by the chief, they are likely to be uh, candidates who will better their lot. And, 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 and so the endorsement serves as this cue. So as a strategy to figure out whether chief's endorsement has uh, an effect on vote choice, we took um, uh, the endorsement. Okay, so I'm just running, running ahead of my own slides here. So th there is an empirical uh, difficulty in, in deciding whether chiefs have an, have an effect. Uh, first of all, chiefs might just simply endorse a popular candidate within the uh, community. So it might be difficult to see the direction of effect. Is it chiefs endorsing a popular candidate or citizens voting with somebody that the chief has endorsed? The two might not be very hard to disentangle. The ballot is secret. And as you know, Caroline and, and, and her colleague uh, uh, showed uh, re recently and, and in the presentation, Africans don't want their chiefs to tell them who to vote for. So it's not very clear whether chiefs have any influence on what people are voting at the ballot box. Uh, and also regarding mechanisms, you know, if chiefs are using influence come from coercive channels versus cooperative channels, they both produce the same outcome. It's both a vote for the endorsed person. And so it's very hard to disentangle the two and therefore we need fine grain uh, individual level data to be able to tell how chiefs influence votes if they do. So we randomly expose people to their traditional leaders endorsement during the Ghana 2020 election campaign. We surveyed them before and after the elections. Uh, we estimate whether they have an effect uh, in the full sample and by voters' partisanship and proud approval of the chief. Uh, mechanism, we look at the different parts, as I showed you before, of the endorsement, so the rationale uh, and the approval versus just showing people the approval of the chief without the rationale. Uh, and then we also look at theoretically relevant intermediate variables about different things linked to uh, you know, coerciveness or cooperative channels to see which of these channels may be uh, the one at work. Okay, so for partisanship, there are two, three groups we look at, those who are co-partisan with the incumbent, those who are opposed, and those who are not aligned to any party. Prior approval, we ask people how they assess their traditional authority uh, and then group those who 
rated them for and above as approving and those otherwise not approving. These are some characteristics of, of those we interviewed and for the sake of time, I'll skip that. Uh, in wave one, we asked people to click in secret who they are going to vote for in the upcoming elections, whether, you know, with all the list of candidates competing. And in, in the wave two, after the election, we asked who they were actually voted for. So the result, uh, we find that in the pre-election phase, um, the endorsement, those who saw the endorsement of the chief of the incumbent candidate were four percentage points more likely to say they were going to vote for the, the, the president. In the post-election phase, which is this side, we see that the effect disappears. Now, we have reasons for why it disappears. It's mostly uh, uh, associated with those who were undecided in the first round, who are more likely to push to voting for the incumbent in the post-election uh, post survey. Uh, and we think that it's more of a spillover effect in there. But essentially, uh, chief's sort of uh, chief's endorsement had some influence, at least in the pre-election phase. Uh, when we disaggregate the results by partisanship, we see here that it is those who are unaligned to any party who were influenced by the endorsement of the chief. Those who are already going to vote for the the president were not influenced, obviously. Those who were strongly in opposition were not influenced by the chief's endorsement. And the effect is really high. Now, we, when we look at approval, uh, we see that that also shapes the effect of the endorsement. But more critically, we find that those who were unaligned and approved of the chief's performance were those who were significantly shaping the results that we report, which seems to suggest that uh, there is some sort of sophistication in using the endorsement of chiefs within the elections. It's those who are undecided, trying to figure out who to vote for and uh, trusted the chief, so to speak, performing well, who were moved by the chief's uh, endorsement. So for mechanism, we disaggregate the parts. Uh, we don't find that providing rationale makes any uh, big difference. So whether you just hear the endorsement or hear the endorsement and the rationale, they both have similar effect on, 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 on vote choice. When it comes to the different intermediate variables, we ask whether uh, among those who were you know, opposing, uh, among those who were unaligned, uh, we asked, you know, whether they had different perceptions about the quality of the candidate, whether they, it's more likable, trustworthy, uh, the candidate performance in the future, uh, the relationship between the chief and the politician going forward, and whether they think uh, here, voters' private gain, that uh, by voting with the chief, uh, the chief will be in a better position to provide private benefits to them and their family, or whether they thought there would be disadvantage in any way, which speaks to the things about coercion. The result seems to suggest that uh, the effect of chief endorsement runs through uh, personal quality, likability and trustworthiness of the candidate who is endorsed, and the expectation that they will provide local public goods we don't see much effect with the other one. So the summary of, of what we find is that there is an increase, uh, endorsement, chiefly endorsement, increase uh, the vote for the endorsed candidate for about 4.3 percentage points in a full sample. Uh, is the effect among unaligned voters who drives the results and even stronger when they are unaligned and approve of the chief's performance. Uh, both aspects, you know, whether we are assigned, whether we expose people to rationale or not, doesn't matter for the results. Um, and we we find that the effect runs through more cooperative channel than coercive channel. And I think the discussion in the previous presentation speaks to that. Uh, there's improvement in trust of the candidate who's endorsed and the expect, expect, expectation that they will actually provide local public goods. Um, do they undermine electoral accountability? I think the answer is yes and no. 
I think that the results that we find suggest a sophisticated use of information by online voters. But yes, uh, in the sense that they might be uh, endorsing only incumbents because that's what we observe most of the time. And so they might com compound uh, incumbency advantage and therefore uh, tilt the electoral playing field for, uh, uh, for the incumbent. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this presentation and for really great insight into how um, how chiefs can affect the the uh, vote choice of of citizens. Um, it is now uh, six o'clock. Well, here in South Africa, but on the hour for everyone. Um, and so we have a, a few more minutes, about ten more minutes, uh, for Q and A. Um, you can either put them in uh, your question in the chat or you can raise your hand and then uh, directly ask one of our presenters. Okay, we have... Tracy, who has a question. Tracy, please go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tracy. I wanted to ask um, Caroline, the question is directed to Caroline. When you were doing um, the research, was there a specific definition that was there for the term legitimacy? Or maybe I can say is legitimacy in traditional leadership the same with um, legitimacy in uh, politics at national level? Okay, great. Um, Matisse, do you wanna take several questions or how do you want, yeah. Yeah, we've got, I think, four questions, so we'll take all of them and then we'll do a round of responses. Next one, I think, was Hangala. Hangala, please go ahead. All right. Um, yeah, thank you very much to all the presenters. Uh, I think my question is mainly for Caroline, but maybe there can be a Ghana and Malawi perspective as well. So I'm kind of interested in how the role of traditional leader um, is mediated with, by the role of uh, religious leaders. And, and I say this because in a number of African countries that are uh, conservative in terms of Christianity, uh, the views of you know, Christian leaders can at times contradict uh, the, you know, the influence of traditional leaders. So with Afrobarometer data, for example, do you see any changes over time in the, you know, the uh, legitimacy that traditional leaders have, and how does that map out when you look at the, the role of uh, the influence of religious leaders? And perhaps maybe a Ghana and Malawi perspective on how uh, religious leaders affect the influence of traditional leaders. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. And then next, I think, is Robert and then Devin. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Matt, for putting this together and for all the presenters you know, on the presentations. Uh, my question is for George, you know, George, fascinating work uh, here during this election, you know, I just wonder if you could perhaps comment on, you know, a lot of us who do elections and surveys, um, you know, we look at, we usually have these effects uh, where we look at the kind of post-electoral um, kind of memory of people, right, and asking people about past behavior. But what's so unique about the study that you showed us this morning is that you were actually um, introducing a treatment during a live event. Right. So I was just curious, you know, to speak or if you could speak to kind of how this may have shaped real life behavior, you know, and if those um, it perhaps you could talk about the effects that you did give the, you know, kind of the endorsements of these leaders, how um, perhaps your sample may or may not be different than the entire voting age population that participated in the election. Uh, so just, you know, this kind of interactive element that you have in a real life event, um, just some thoughts about the kind of research methodology there. So wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, then Darren. 
Hi, um, yeah, I, I really loved um, all three of these presentations. So thank you so much. Uh, my question is mostly for George, but um, uh, I, would, I would be curious if anyone had feedback in general. Um, do you have any information or, or any general thoughts on whether um, the, the consistency of the chief's endorsement over time affects uh, the, the chief's ability to, to uh, wield influence on vote choice? So, so if, if there's the chief who endorses the same party every election, um, then you might expect voters to, to sort of align with that chief. But, but if the chief changes his endorsement between elections, uh, do, do we do we know anything about what effect that might have on um, on the chief's ability to affect vote choice? Great. Um, and I would like to ask Ahmed to um, keep his question for a moment. Um, we'll do one round of responses and then we have Ahmed and I think George uh, Bobmilia also posted a question in the chat. Um, Caroline, do you want to go first, and then we do the round? Okay. Um, um, first, uh, you asked about the the question of how we, uh, whether we give a definition for the term legitimacy, and we don't actually even use that term directly in our questions, partly because um, uh, it, it might be a difficult term for people to interpret. So we assessed legitimacy based on sort of the, the, the constellation of findings around how much people are trust, how much different leaders are trusted and how um, much they're seen as being corrupt and how, how their leadership is rated overall. So we don't directly ask legitimacy in, exactly because um, it can be different to interpret, difficult to interpret. So um, given that we base it on, you know, our assessment on trust, um, corruption and performance, uh, I guess my take would be largely that those that we do see those as those kind of assessments is applying similarly across both the elected leaders and the traditional leaders. So I think they're pretty comparable in that sense, uh, looking at those those terms. Um, I hope that captures what you were asking. In terms of the the link between religious leaders and, and traditional leaders, I think I'm going to probably defer more to my um, my colleagues here because this we don't have anything directly on that in Afrobarometer. We um, we look at them more in relationship to elected leaders. Um, you know, we can compare level of, of trust and see that they're generally higher. I'm not sure I completely got where your question was going. I heard where your question was going on the, the role of conservative Christianity and how that might affect traditional leaders, why it would undermine them. I'm not, uh, I'm interested, would be interested to talk about that more, but maybe the others might want to take that up if they've got thoughts on, on that interaction in, in your countries or elsewhere. And I'll hand it over to Happy and George. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, the issue of uh, traditional leadership and the religious leadership. Um, I, I didn't capture the question very well, but uh, my understanding was that, uh, um, do you think that uh, traditional um, uh, leadership uh, is uh, affected by uh, some uh, religious leadership factors? I would say, um, I also don't have real data that uh, connects these two, but uh, uh, what I can say is that uh, in, in Malawi, we have some few areas where it is uh, Muslim dominated. Originally, um, uh, 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 religious leaders were also traditional leaders in those areas. But in other areas where it's in, uh, Christian dominated, they, are, they tend to be different. Traditional leaders and uh, um, uh, religious leaders, mostly um, uh, from the missionaries from UK, uh, the Catholics, etc., uh, they have nothing to do with the traditional leadership. So um, there is that difference. But the uh, traditional leaders are also trusted, religious leaders are trusted. But whether they affect one another, I don't necessarily have data that, um, I mean, we haven't done an analysis that looks at um, uh, those elements. Thank you. Thank you, Happy. Okay, so I have a couple of questions here. Well, how I think that my that what I take from the first question has to do with the representativeness of our sample, and also like carrying out a research in a real time event and and probably response 
uh, by us and recovery of memory and so on. I think uh, in terms of representativeness, we looked at whether the sample that we happened to, so we were guided by a lot of ethical issues when we were picking up places to study. One is we wanted uh, places where actual endorsement happened, which obviously is not random. Um, but then we were then have to compare, when we compare these areas within the, so the Bono areas, the traditional areas we study, were three of them, they were all part of the Akan uh, traditional system. If we look at the census data on uh, various characteristics in terms of rural airbinders and, and you know, things, things that we could find, electricity assets and so on. Um, the areas we studied were quite similar to the, to the Akan, you know, people who live within the Akan dominated regions of the country, which is also not totally, you know, different from um, many parts of the country. When we look at the Afrobarometer data as well, in terms of contacting traditional leaders and so on, these areas were also quite similar uh, across the, the, those within the Akan traditional system. So in that sense, our data is sim, you know, it's quite representative. It's not a representative sample, but they are quite similar in that sense. Uh, we, in terms of recall, I mean, first of all, the first survey, you immediately obviously tell us who you're gonna vote for. Uh, we did the follow-up survey you know, just within a week uh, to make sure that people obviously know who they, you know, at least they could recall within a week who they voted for. Um, when we look at non-response rate, like those who said, I, I don't remember or uh, don't know who I vote for, it's cut across the treatment, uh, the treatments that we offered. So it doesn't affect, it would not affect the results that I have presented to you in that, in that sense. Um, consistency, I think, um, I can't speak to that with the data we have, and it's, it's a project that I've been talking to, uh, you know, George, who is, I think, here, George Bob Belia, who has also done work on traditional authorities, about trying to document this over time and trying to, you know, see endorsements and so on. And so we can have a more systematic study about this, you know, changes in endorsement. Uh, I think what happens if the 2020 election is anything to go by is that if you endorse the previous incumbent, uh, there's a new uh, president and you just shut up or you just, you know, you don't talk. Essentially, you don't endorse any of that. So I think people get locked in, and this is just speculative. People just lock, get locked in in those they have endorsed in the past. Um, and and uh, we took a look at legitimacy, but because this is just a one-time cross-sectional cross data, it is hard to know legitimacy over time because that has to be linked with performance of the elected person and so on. And we haven't been able to do that. So I can't speak much to that, but that's an interesting question that needs to be worked on by either us or other people in the field uh, in the future. Um, George actually posed a question about um, uh, what, how the two party dominant system have influenced chiefly endorsement in Ghana, you know, I thought I would ask him, uh, but um, I think I, I think you know the fact that we have two dominant groups. It means that you are almost in one camp or the other. And as I said, you probably shut up if the one that you endorsed the last time is not the one uh, who is the incumbent of fear of not getting things for your community. Um, but I, you know, I, you know, I think the party system we have, the two dominant system, means that there are only two options that traditional authorities can really endorse, and 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 it will be interesting to figure out where there's multiple parties that are viable, and how that shapes the nature of endorsement within those contexts as well. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, we have then one last question that uh, Ahmed didn't get to ask in the first round. So please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Uh, my question, actually I have two questions which is related to each other uh, and I'll go directly for a line. Uh, thanks everyone. Uh, 
the first one is I was wondering if you consider the region's urban uh, rural areas if it has influence on uh, traditional institutions, how people associate with something. But also another aspect is the the role of colonizer and colonized. Like if colonizers, uh, uh, the UK, the British system, and the French one has a role in in how people associate. Uh, traditional institutions. Thank you. Yeah, um, we do have uh, information, so we can look at both of those things. I mean, we gen generally, well, we definitely see that in general, uh, support for traditional leaders is higher in rural areas than in urban areas, where of course people tend to have more direct contact, but that even in urban areas, it is generally quite high. So it's one of the things that, you know, as we do sort of next level analysis, we'll sort of look more closely at those breakdowns. Um, but, but uh, um, you know, the general rule is more support in, urban, in rural areas, but, but even urban areas, there's quite a bit of allegiance to traditional leadership in their role. Um, in terms of the colonizer, we have, um, I, I'm just trying to remember, I haven't looked at that closely in this round. Um, I think in the past rounds, it was at least mentioned, but um, uh, one of the things we do tend to see is that the places that have the highest levels of support for traditional leaders tend to be a number of the Francophone, former Francophone uh, French colonies in West Africa, Mali, Niger, um, Burkina Faso, uh, some of the countries in that area. But it's not consistent across all the Francophone countries. And so there's, I think there's quite a bit of intermixing and not, you know, given the differences in the, the colonial systems and how they interacted with traditional leaders, you might have expected a more clear um, distinction uh, between the two. But I think, aside from the fact that kind of a few at the, the highest end are all French, former French colonies, um, uh, there, there isn't a strong connection that I've seen kind of across, across all the countries on that, on those lines. And, you know, considering the, the sort of length of time of independence and how much there's been both sort of the authoritarian area, era and what governments, many governments trying to control and undermine traditional authority during that period. And then a fairly long democratic, more democratic era that there's been, you know, and the role of traditional leadership changing quite a bit throughout that period that that sort of the the lack of strong continuing uh, effect of the, the colonizer may be partly explained by the long period since then in which things have, have evolved. So I'm not sure if, if uh, George or Happy would have any thoughts on that either. Let me uh, briefly say something on that one. Um, when uh, looking at Malawi, because it, almost over 80% of the population is rural. So when we looked at the data, it clearly showed that the difference between the urban and the rural was uh, uh, unlike in um, uh, the uh, general Afrobarometer data for the whole of Africa, in Malawi, actually, the difference for the support of uh, traditional leadership um, uh, was not uh, statistically significant between rural and the urban. Um, uh, uh, not only uh, one of the reasons, apart from being 80% of the population being in the rural area, is that uh, there's a, um, uh, the interaction between the urban and the rural is very high. So although we have people in the urban areas, but mostly they will have land in the village. They also have a house in the rural area. So there's a lot of interaction between those who live in the urban and the rural. So at the end of the day, the dynamics and the perceptions are not significantly different in relation to uh, traditional leaders because they, those in the urban and the rural, they frequently also interact with the traditional leaders. Thank you. George, do you want to add? something to the question as well no no yeah okay great i think i don't care <laughs> <laughs> great then um yeah i would uh, close it at this point we're 20 minutes uh, past the hour um big thank you to to all three presenters for for really some great insight uh, on the topic um and to both give us uh, detailed um, case studies and as well as some some cross country comparisons. Um, I would also like to encourage everyone on the call to check out uh, the YouTube channel, where we have uh, other presentations as well, 
um, both on substantive stuff, but also on, on how to actually do surveys and uh, measure certain things. Um, so feel free to, to check it out there. And um, we'd also like to invite you to um, join our next webinar uh, at the end of next month. Um, the topic will soon be announced uh, via the usual emails. So thank you very much and enjoy your evening or the rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you.